Okay, I think we are ready. And we will move on now with the last panel for this conference today. I'm Alexander Krzelowski, Director of the Macedonian Center for International Cooperation and also coordinator of the CELDI uh, network. And I was uh, got the privilege to moderate this uh, last session, though some would say it is a punishment <laughs> to, to do that. Uh, well, I guess uh, we have uh, the real fighters against corruption in the room now, after everybody else left, uh, and uh, the people committed to, to this work and to this uh, problem are here are really interested to hear more about uh, what the panelists uh, have to say in, uh, on the topic of implementing policies and strategies uh, to practically fight, uh, fight corruption. And for that, we have actually two directors of anti-corruption agencies from the region, from Montenegro and Kosovo, and three, three researchers, analysts that, that uh, are following and developing tools, basically, for, uh, for this, uh, for more effective fight against uh, corruption. With me uh, here today are Dr. Todor Galev uh, from the Center of, uh, of Study of Democracy, director of research, and probably creator of many of these methodologies that, uh, that CSD is implementing. Il Buleshkai from the director of the uh, anti-corruption agency in Kosovo. Jelena Pero is the same for Montenegro. Sofia Petkova is from International Republican Institute, project program manager for senior program manager in, in Bulgaria. And finally, Andrei Maksut, senior researcher in the Romanian Academic Society. So, uh, in the next uh, around one hour, uh, everybody will have around 10 minutes to present uh, their view on, uh, on the tools, let's say, uh, for assessment on anti-corruption policies and how we can do, do better uh, as uh, even with all these things done in the past, uh, CELDI reports show that the corruption is still uh, on a very high level in the Balkan region and obviously we should do more to tackle this, uh, this uh, problem on various aspects. Uh, this will be good uh, to, to emphasize the cooperation between public uh, bodies and uh, NGOs uh, or, or other monitoring uh, bodies and uh, where to focus, whether on local level corruption, whether on high level corruption or whether on uh, public procurements, uh, on uh, lobbying for, for getting tenders, etc., uh, and other uh, points of, of high, high corruption. So I would not uh, prolong uh, more. I'll give the floor to Dr. Todor Gale from CSD to enter the debate on these topics. Um, I have a presentation. Okay. Well, uh, Hello all, uh, and uh, thank you for being uh, with us here today. Um, actually, I'll uh, showcase you uh, one of our uh, methodologies that have been implemented uh, in many of the countries in the region. Uh, and uh, in many cases with the strong support of our cell partners. Uh, so thank you all of you that have been engaged in this and make it possible. Uh, this is what we called uh, uh, our um, MACP or Monitoring Anti-Corruption Policy Implementation Methodology, which was uh, developed in 2015 with uh, uh, support, with the support of the um, uh, DG Home of the European Commission uh, and after uh, and since then implemented in many countries and many different public organizations uh, so uh, just to say that uh, this methodology is actually built to be a policy tool so it is designed to be either a part of a broader uh, policy uh, uh, cycle which means uh, uh, that it could be part of uh, uh, what we call state capture uh, assessment diagnostics and MACP uh, methodology uh, could serve as an element of this uh, assessment uh, which 
can lead to uh, particular investigations, but uh, it could be also used as a separate tool for assessing the um, policy, uh, uh, the effectiveness and applicability of anti-corruption policies and measures on, uh, on institutional level. Actually, uh, it was designed uh, for an assessment and periodic monitoring uh, of anti-corruption policies uh, uh, and um, uh, was designed as assisted self-assessment approach, which is important uh, from the viewpoint of the, um, of the, um, of the uh, public organizations because you know public organizations uh, uh, want to have instruments that can run by themselves by, uh, uh, and not always subcontracting uh, um, external experts for this. Um, it is applied through a quantitative service among institution employees external experts familiar with the institution activities and what we call clients of the public uh, uh, institution. So uh, uh, physical or, um, uh, or, or legal persons that interact with uh, the public institution and that actually use the uh, public services offered by the public institution. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, the uh, MACP diagnostic cycle was designed to uh, assess not uh, only the uh, estimate level of corruption risk within the institutions, but also uh, the levels of corruption pressure. So actual experience and this is an important thing because when you compare and I'll show you in a uh, while uh, this example when you compare the uh, actual experience with what is uh, 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 the uh, estimation of the uh, employees so actual experience of clients of the institution with the uh, estimation of the uh, uh, organization employees you can see the differences uh, just to give you an example, uh, in last uh, uh, last month, last year actually, we had the chance to uh, introduce a very similar, based on this MACP uh, uh, approach, uh, uh, methodology for assessment of corruption risk in the National Revenue Agency of Bulgaria. And uh, what we found was that um, the estimation and the assessment of uh, the clients of National Revenue Agency for one of the uh, activities that have been estimated uh, shows that uh, this activity is much more higher, uh, has much more higher risk than the estimation of the uh, uh, employees themselves. And this is uh, how, uh, uh, how this could help the public uh, organization to design better anti-corruption policies and measures. Uh, the uh, MACP methodology includes, uh, uh, first of all, uh, as I said, surveys with officials, so employees of uh, the organization, experts, external experts that have been familiar with this organization, uh, and uh, clients. Uh, in addition, it also uh, includes some in-depth interviews that are needed to give deeper uh, knowledge on the uh, uh, anti-corruption policies and measures that have been assessed. Uh, and just to flash two examples, here are um, uh, uh, the results from uh, the analysis of Bulgarian Ministry of Defense, uh, which shows what is the actual corruption pressure and uh, uh, actually uh, which, uh, which activities uh, are covered by specific 
uh, anti-corruption policies or measures. Of course, this is anonymized, so sorry for this, but uh, uh, we don't, the, 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 um, uh, the names and the titles of the uh, actual uh, anti-corruption policies and measures are confidential, uh, and as well the activities. Uh, so you can see the discrepancies where, uh, for example, uh, activity two is covered by several anti-corruption policies and measures. Uh, the percentage uh, shows whether uh, this is, uh, th there is a coverage of uh, this activity or with the uh, respective uh, policy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the uh, actual corruption pressure which is given above, 13%, uh, shows that uh, this is one of the less risky uh, activities actually in the Ministry of Defense. So these discrepancies between what is the actual corruption pressure and whether uh, and where the uh, existing policies actually cover these activities uh, is also telling for the management. So these results are designed to serve the management of the uh, public organization and uh, to fine-tune uh, the uh, um, uh, existing uh, anti-corruption policies or to design new ones. Uh, just another um, uh, example, uh, in addition to the possibility to uh, compare between the um, uh, assessments or estimation um, between uh, uh, employees and clients or uh, uh, experts, there is also a possibility to compare uh, about, uh, to compare the estimates within uh, the different group of uh, employees. Uh, and here in the um, uh, results of the Bulgarian border police from 2015, you see that um, the management staff of Bulgarian border police actually think that uh, two activities related to the, uh, uh, I would say, the central uh, role of the border police, so the checkpoints uh, activities uh, at the border are much more risky than uh, the estimation uh, of uh, the um, regular employees. And here the question could be, is it true that this Th that uh, the, uh, the, these, activities, these activities are uh, less risky, uh, or the employees actually knowing that there is uh, higher risk in these activities, knowing that there are some corruption um, uh, deals, that there are some corruption uh, um, uh, 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 presence in, in these activities, uh, they actually give what we call a uh, socially acceptable answer. Um, and in the beginning, when you start the analysis, you don't know which is the uh, answer uh, of, of this question, but you can see the differences and you can start digging deeper and deeper. Uh, uh, I'll stop here and just to conclude with this, uh, it is important that uh, uh, when we are designing methodologies for uh, analyzing uh, some kind of uh, corruption policies, or in this case, the effectiveness of anti-corruption policies uh, at institutional level, uh, to design it in a way that uh, could uh, not only serve the research purposes that many of us have, but also to serve the purposes of the uh, public institutions. So uh, that's why we think that this kind of um, uh, methodologies and approaches that uh, uh, give the possibility of public institutions uh, to, um, uh, 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 to strengthen and uh, to uh, uh, make better their existing anti-corruption policies and measures based on evidences, so based on hard data, based on, uh, uh, on uh, research data, uh, it's an important step towards better anti-corruption environment in the whole country. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Galef, for sharing the macro methodology with whom I think cell uh, partners are very well acquainted and uh, implemented already in several institutions in each of the Balkan countries. So I guess uh, our representatives from the institutions can learn from it and implement it in their own uh, institution to see the risks and how to fight uh, corruption and uh, as a good tool to, to assess each individual institution. Uh, maybe the anti-corruption agencies have done it for themselves and we will see <laughs> from the next two speakers and we will start with Il Buleshkai from the uh, Kosovo Anti-Corruption Agency. So, Mr. Buleshkai, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, first of all. It's a great pleasure to be among uh, uh, leading scholars as uh, Professor uh, Todor uh, on the field of uh, anti-corruption and also among uh, practitioners uh, from the region and the field of anti-corruption. Uh, we are here, uh, as uh, the first speaker stated, uh, after uh, some developments in very near and to, to Bulgaria, to our countries, where uh, this uh, viol violence that's happening in Ukraine has tested our systems and uh, made uh, visible more how, uh, how weak uh, we can be from the foreign influence. And that makes extremely important how our countries, namely our institutions, uh, work and deal uh, uh, in the sense of preventing uh, corruption, preventing uh, possibilities to get corrupt and then influenced either for, from foreign influence or from, uh, from in-country influence. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I will do just a very brief introduction of myself. I'm uh, leading the institution uh, since the uh, end of 2021, so I'm pretty new on the field. Uh, and the agency also changed the name in this uh, process. So <laughs> it's, it's interesting also to mention because uh, as the topic of this uh, panel is uh, revision of policies. So it's, it's, uh, it's great when, the, uh, when our legislators have time to review uh, the policies and make the necessary adoptions uh, because uh, same as anything else, same as human beings, even institutions develop and, and find, uh, find uh, other spaces that are not covered that need to be covered from, from the work. Yeah. Uh, I'll do a, also a sh very short introduction of, uh, of the organization I'm, I'm leading because it will bring some context to what I'm saying at a later stage. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm director of Agency for Prevention of Corruption. While the agency uh, was established as a agency, anti-corruption agency of Kosovo in 2006. Can I get the? Okay. Sorry, no. I can get it. It's a great pleasure to have it passed from the from professor. <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, the agency is pretty small as an agency. It has around 42 uh, staff employees organized in four uh, departments. One of them is uh, finance and general affairs as any other institution, while the other uh, three ones are uh, dealing uh, with the mandate of the agency, which is declaration and verification of assets, assets and gifts and its department for fighting corruption that it will take a bit more time on my presentation because it deals with investigation, administrative investigation and pre-crime uh, pre investigation or preliminary investigation as we call it, uh, and its department for prevention of conflict of interest. Uh, why I mentioned 42 employees? Uh, Kosovo has around 2 million inhabitants and around 10,000 square kilometers with around 200 institutions. So in order to have the context of the scope of the work, I think it's important to see how much uh, resources uh, state includes in the prevention of corruption or uh, in some other cases on the uh, on fighting of corruption, being that in prosecution or judiciary. Uh, so we uh, are in charge for, uh, for declaring common uh, assets of public officials and uh, verifying this uh, also, we do investigations, including political party finances in a sense. We do work on prevention of conflict of interest. An important uh, tool that we have a role is protection of whistleblowers. Uh, and we deal with investigation of external whistleblowing reports. And furthermore, uh, we 
uh, do also monitoring of public procurement activities. On top of this, from last year, we do assessment of legislation in the sense of corruption proofing of legislation, support and monitor integrity plans of institutions, and uh, we are planning to start uh, sector risk analysis on corruption based on uh, methodology that Council of Europe through Greco mechanisms are about to finalize. Okay, I'm not stopping only because we have the four main laws that we've worked, and since I joined the institution, we have experienced uh, a number of successes. We have doubled criminal reports sent to prosecution compared to a year before. So from 150 cases, last year we have sent 254. Then from uh, monitoring 108 procurement procedures, we have monitored 218 and we have issued 211 recommendations. So we have, we believe we have improved at least 211 procurement procedures. And, uh, and then, uh, last but not least important, we have reviewed 212, uh, 25 cases of potential of conflict of interest compared to 105 a year before. Uh, these numbers uh, for us are impressive in the sense, but they not necessarily show either the level of corruption or they show the level of success. It's, it's statistics the way how we, in, uh, how we want to interpret. Uh, but what we wanted to say with these numbers is that we believe that public and the uh, public's trust on institution increased, and I think this is also uh, crucial for the success of any any institution, including ours and, and, and the institutions of my colleagues around. Uh, we, uh, in the sense of uh, doing investigation, we can open two kind of investigation. One, if someone reports, the second one, we Came to, to, we come to that information, then we, we start and ex officio initiate the, the, uh, this kind of investigations. Something about techniques that we use, uh, similar most probably to anyone else here, but uh, it's I think good to, to reinstate. So we do a document examination, we take written statements from parties involved we do interviews with the parties involved. Uh, we investigate their past, the history of offenses, because based on that we can draw conclusions if, we, if, it's, if it can go just with a warning or it needs to go to prosecution. Uh, we seek information from institutions, and here it's also crucial. We uh, contribute with tax administration. We, uh, we cooperate with uh, cadastral agency and with all the databases that can uh, give us information in order to finalize uh, any case. Uh, what F usually is a fail, but I think it's crucial also to, to see uh, the circumstances related to the case, because sometimes it may seem that something, something is like violation, but uh, it ends up not to be. Uh, and at the end, all these documents, all this information is analyzed properly from the, the limited number of, uh, of staffers. Uh, outcomes, yes, we can send criminal reports, we can close cases. I think uh, there was a number of agencies, uh, in, especially in, in Western Europe, that they cannot close a case without a decision of uh, prosecution. We have that power. And then uh, we uh, follow up all these cases uh, in, in, the, in all these two institutions. Uh, I think it's important to have some, uh, some provisions in the legislation. Uh, regarding cooperation and feedback received from institutions, in the past we were having uh, problems. So it depended on the will of a given prosecutor to uh, send back information what's happening with uh, this uh, case that we are uh, giving to the prosecution for further proceeding, whereas the new law uh, obliges this uh, prosecution and police to, to inform us about uh, the, 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 well, how they dealt with the cases, and in case they overthrow, we have the right to complain with the new law in place to the, appeal, to the prosecution of appeals. Or we can go back and do our administrative investigation for and, and recommend uh, measures, disciplinary measures against uh, staffers, and which is what is very important and I, I think is a very strong uh, tool that we have in our hands is 
we, we can annul uh, decisions, for example, that are taken uh, if they are taken on the conflict of interest basis, for example. So we do not have to send this case to prosecution, we can automatically uh, annul, and then the institution has to sue us and to get the rights through the judiciary. Uh, last but not least important, I think it's very important that it helped us a lot, uh, cooperation with the civil society, because of limited number, because of limited uh, resources, and also because of limited uh, ability to do research either in country or out of country. Civil society in Kosovo, including media, uh, was crucial to, uh, to raise and uh, to report uh, cases uh, to, the, to the agency. And I can freely say the cases that made the, took the most of the public attention were the cases that we have received either from civil society uh, or from uh, media, which is very, and I think that a line, open line of communication and sharing information with, with uh, civil society and with media is uh, crucial. Okay, I'm not stopping into the challenges, but I think, uh, Possibilities. There are possibilities uh, to, to benefit from the new technology. With an agency, we are looking and uh, to use uh, artificial intelligence in, in reviewing the reports because we get a lot of documents that we cannot, like uh, paper-based, uh, draw conclusions. So, we are part of two international projects, uh, and we believe that we will be able to benefit from uh, these two. One is uh, to use the South Korea model of a uh, clean portal for Kosovo purposes. Another one is the development project of University of Pristina and some other universities in, in Europe uh, to use artificial intelligence to, to help us draw right, like red flags and, 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 and have kind of draw indications about potential uh, violations or misuse of, of, uh, of office. Uh, and I think another great opportunity that we see in our work is uh, the, either like regional initiatives as the RAI or meetings like this, and we benefit uh, a lot. So I think the key, for me, key, how to say, like uh, common denominator is cooperation, either with internal stakeholders or with uh, regional stakeholders, uh, because we are not very different, so to say. I think an issue that may be, uh, uh, today in Moldova, it's very possible that it's happening in Kosovo, but we could not notice that. So it's, uh, and also uh, having open doors and very sincere cooperation with civil society, with the ones that work at least in the, in the anti-corruption and uh, ethics uh, field uh, is uh, crucial if you want to have some kind of success. And I believe uh, we have showed some success in the last two years. Uh, Kosovo as a country is progressing either in the, uh, in the databases of uh, Freedom House or in other databases or Transparency International databases. So we believe this is reached only because uh, we managed to have uh, good and sincere cooperation with all these uh, stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Guleske, and uh, especially for emphasizing the cooperation and with civil society, including the, the media, as we are both on, on the same boat, I guess, in, in fighting corruption. We will have some uh, uh, doubts about the public institutions, as probably the corruption is mainly there, but at least uh, anti-corruption agencies and civil society uh, are uh, naturally committed to that. I was also glad to to hear that uh, Macedonians are not the only ones with identity issues, that you had to change the name as well. <laughs> uh, but also uh, from the uh, s statistics that you worked, uh, that you mentioned, I was also surprised uh, that with two million people you have 200 institutions. I think that we uh, are also with two million have 1,300 institutions. So you are good. <laughs> and finally, uh, your uh, statistics on, uh, on, on the cases uh, reminded me of a, of a joke about statistics uh, that says it's like bikini, it's, it's showing a lot but not the most important or interesting parts. And in your case, yes, the, the number was 254 cases submitted for criminal prosecution, but uh, we, we, you didn't tell us or statistics didn't show how many ended up in jail from those cases. 
But let's keep that for the debate later and give the floor now to another uh, director of the agency, anti-corruption agency, this time in Montenegro, Jelena Perovic. Uh, dear colleague, uh, co uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to share with you good practices regarding the work and methodologies that we apply, which ensure non-selectivity in our uh, actions and support our independencies on behalf of Montenegro and the institution I had the Agency of Prevention of Corruption. We have been uh, proud, uh, prof prof profoundly satisfied since we have just left the best year since the establishment uh, of the agency in which our results were recognized by international pa partners, primarily the European Commission and Greco, from whom we received praise uh, for our performance in the prevention of corruption. During the seven years since we had has been founded, our institution has developed a sophisticated system for checking the income and assets for public officials, which is uh, established electronic database and network, networking with the state institutions obtain relevant data. The control of property records has been carried out based on the annual verification plan adopted following the recommendation of the experts of the Council of Europe. The checking procedure has been based on a methodology that uh, guarantees non-selectivity and excludes the possibility of subje subjective and based selection of public officials and civil servants. The score of our work in this area is evident, evidenced by the fact that in 2022 we received uh, 11,784 reports on uh, income and assets, the most uh, ever on an annual basis. Uh, we controlled 1,778 reports, which uh, ex uh, ex exceeded the annual pla plan by 30 uh, percent and the performance from 2021 by 60 percent. Moreover, our institution completed the additional check, the most complex type for control, which re uh, uh, ref refers to 20 high-ranking officials elected following the degree of uh, vulnerability of the area of functions to, corru uh, to corruption. Uh, with a proactive approach, we initiated uh, 423 administrative procedures and submit 1,057 uh, uh, requests to initiated misdemeanor procedure, in both cases the most since the uh, existing of our institution. At the same time, the number of proceedings uh, initiated against former and current, uh, currently public officials is, is almost equal, which conforms our indiscrimination method. Being deeply proud of these results, we are also aware that there is a room for uh, further progress for uh, additional improvement of uh, efficiencies and uh, effectiveness. Uh, for this reason, in the coming period, in the cooperation with the expert of the Council of Europe, we will develop a, a methodology for in-deep verification of the assets of public officials to create an effective, uh, effective mechanism that would, among other things, also include the verification of members of the joint household and persons relate to the public officials. Another novelty planned for this year is the connecting of the agency with the monitoring electronic public procurement system in the area of conflict of interest and control of data submitted by political subject. We have also achieved measurable results in terms of detect, uh, detection and prevention conflict of interest and uh, res uh, respecting uh, restriction on the performance of public functions as a re uh, result of edu uh, educational activities aimed of uh, strengthening public officials' awareness of their legal obligation as well as trust in, in the agency, its importance and the uh, quality uh, of uh, the uh, of sorry 
of work. In 2022, we received uh, 230 requests for opinion of the uh, existence of conflict of interests and uh, limitation in the performance of public functions, the most since the, uh, the establishment, and uh, acted on all of them based on the given opinion, uh, opinions and decisions, 24 public officials resigned. Uh, thanks to a large part uh, to our uh, efforts in prevention conflict of interest and uh, declaring assets, the European Commission st uh, stated in the report on the progress of Montenegro for 2022 that the balance of results in the prevention of corruption has further been improved, especially due to the positive trend in the work of the agency. The Greco made a similar sen uh, statement about our performance uh, is, uh, it, uh, in uh, its uh, uh, evolu evaluation report of Montenegro. Uh, when it comes to the methodologies I mentioned at the beginning, as a part of the project implementa uh, implemented by RAI in July 2017, uh, the methodology for assessing the risk of corruption in regulation in Montenegro was uh, developed. It uh, contains a checklist for assessing the risk of corruption in regula uh, uh, regulation and an overview of all potential risks that may arise in the adopt adoption of a certain normative act. In cooperation with the UNDP in Montenegro, we worked on the improved improvement of the methodology and uh, certain an anal anal analysis that um, comprise uh, comparative analysis of practice in 11 countries and analysis uh, of the situation in Montenegro, which recommendation for improving the situation in the area and uh, proposal for a preliminary check, uh, checklist of corruption risk. The improved, uh, imp uh, improved methodology enables easier, easier and more objective identification of uh, regulation that could potentially be the subject of the agency analysis. Uh, the strengthening uh, the integrity of the authorities, uh, the agency in cooperation with the UNDP in November 2022, create a methodology for assessing the application of anti-corruption measures in the judicial system to improve the uh, content uh, and effects of the plans of the uh, integrity of the judicial authorities. Uh, it uh, uh, envisaged the develop, uh, development of uh, criteria and uh, in indicators based on the integrity plans, based on which scoring and ranking the, of authorities in the uh, aforementioned system will be carried out. In December 2022, a special IT application was develop, developed for the application of the methodology. The agency created the methodology for the the assessment of the application of anti-corruption measures in 2021 and applied with uh, uh, that version uh, to uh, two systems, state administration and social and child protection. The, pr uh, the purpose of methodology is to uh, uh, assess whether authorities implement anti-corruption measures and whether their uh, their uh, application has positive effects as well as to in, uh, encourage authorities to be proactive, ve proactive when planning and implement, implementing anti-corruption measures. It is planned that um, uh, it, uh, uh, the coming period the methodology uh, will be extended to authorities from the other seven sectors, local self-government, education, health, state -owned owned enterprises, uh, enterprise uh, owned by local self-government units, independent and regula uh, regulatory uh, authorities and culture. The ultimate goal is to increase the uh, awareness of employees in the public sector about the importance of integrity plans and the prevent, uh, preventive fight against corruption. 
Finally, we believe that the agency will continue to make a visible contribution to the fight against corruption and the rule of law system written the framework set by the law uh, and uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. I would like to thank the organizers, uh, the Center of Democratic Studies, the Rumunia Academic Society and the leadership for, leadership for development of integrity of uh, South uh, Europe on the call for participant. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Jelena, for updating on uh, improvements that the agency is doing in Montenegro and especially on what you said that some of the, those 200 or something uh, cases that were reported to you for conflict of interest led to some resignation. I think in Macedonia we are still to see any resignation on any issue. Uh, in the last 20 years there was no, no such thing, so I can, we can count this as a, as, a, as a progress. And I think this is also one monitoring tool, both how many cases end up in resignations of politicians or how many are prosecuted in, in, in judiciary and how many are actually sentenced. Uh, for corruptive practices. So thank you on that. And we move on. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm freezing here. I guess that if that is to keep us awake, then fine. But <laughs> I hope we'll warm up the atmosphere with the external view from institutions. So I give the floor to Sofia Petkova. She will focus more on the local uh, level, on municipal corruption. So please. Thank you, Alexander. Um, let me just start by saying uh, what a pleasure it is for me to be here with you today and have this opportunity to share about IRI's programming um, at the municipal level in Bulgaria. Um, let me just uh, mention a few words about IRI. The International Republican Institute is a non-government, non-partisan organization that's operating glob globally in over 100 countries. Um, and our programming focuses on, broadly speaking, fostering democracy. IRI's programming in Bulgaria is focused at countering corruption at the municipal level. We have an ongoing program that started in the autumn of uh, 2021. Our program, as you can see on this map, uh, covers 10 municipalities as um, currently speaking. The aims of our program um, are to first identify vulnerabilities to corruption, secondly to generate solutions to those vulnerabilities um, based on input both from government and non-government stakeholders. The ultimate objective of our programming, however, is to design adopt and implement municipal anti-corruption reform agendas, which I believe is the part, is the reason why we are part of this panel, um, as a, uh, an example of what happens on the ground. On this slide, you can see the different elements uh, that our program consists of, the different stages and how they uh, come one after the other. So we started with a vulnerabilities to corruption assessment process in the 10 municipalities. We also conducted municipal polls. We then uh, had the leaders of our municipalities, that is the mayors, sign a municipal anti-corruption pact at the national anti-corruption conference that we held last year in July here in Sofia. We later on started uh, a process of design and adoption of reform uh, agendas, anti-corruption reform agendas for each of those 10 municipalities. This process was um, implemented through municipal working groups that I will tell you a bit more about later on in the presentation. Um, the reform agendas were uh, were then sent to the mayors of the municipalities for official adoption. Um, we are now in the majority of the municipalities at the stage of uh, initiating reform implementation. And in parallel, we uh, held uh, a training for CSOs and we plan to hold a training for representatives of um, local governments. Um, I will now, I will now um, 
talk about the methodology that stay, uh, stands behind all those elements. The IRI approach focuses on vulnerabilities to corruption. And here we must make one major distinction. Our programming is in the realm of mitigating vulnerabilities, that is, ensuring prevention of corruption through reforms, as opposed to uprooting corruption, which would require punishment, judicial action, and investigations in actual corruption uh, going on. Our VCA methodology, I will use this abbreviation uh, throughout the presentation, it refers to the vulnerabilities to corruption approach assessment methodology, has three main pillars. We start with a political economy analysis, which identifies the main windows of opportunity, but also the main challenges and bottlenecks. Based on this political econo economy analysis, we select a number of um, various stakeholders at the municipal level in all municipalities that we work with, and we collect data, qualitative data, data through semi-structured um, interviews. We then distilled this data, and uh, we designed the vulnerabilities to corruption uh, reports one report per each municipality. Each report then went through the third pillar of the VCA methodology, that is stakeholder validation. Stakeholder validation happened through working groups that I mentioned earlier, um, and I will go back to um, in a bit. What are the main VCA findings? So VCA findings are very specific to each of the 10 municipalities that we've implemented our program with. Uh, but there are five that are rather overarching and we can safely say hold true for all 10 municipalities. First, corruption prevention mechanisms are in place in compliance with national level legislation and requirements, but they are seldom, if at all, used, which creates problems for deterrence and also lowers citizens' trust in those mechanisms. Secondly, transparency is practiced as a formality again, in compliance with national level legislation, but with, uh, without um, ease of use, without a thought as to its accessibility and uh, completeness. Thirdly, informal channels are preferred uh, by citizens and they're used to bypass administrations, which creates a number of other vulnerabilities in respect to uh, accountability, uh, selectivity of access, and so on and so forth. Fourth, um, and this is no surprise, I guess, to anyone in the room, citizens are disengaged from official participation channels and mechanisms. Again, needless to mention the vulnerabilities that this creates in respect to uh, monitoring of decision makers uh, and accountability. Fifthly, there is no substantive policy role for civil society. That is to say, they are um, consulted, civil society organizations and groupies, groupings are consulted on an ad hoc basis, usually when there is a problem, uh, but not in a sustainable uh, manner. What are the implications for policymakers? There are a number of implications, and you can see the three leading ones on this slide. I will just mention what is the, the most important, in, in my view, from for the for the, the current audience that we have gathered here today, and that is anti-corruption work needs to be taken outside Sofia and outside the big cities, and the national anti-corruption framework needs to be supplemented with local systems uh, for um, prevention of corruption. The qualitative tool of the VCA, uh, we supplemented with the quantitative tool of municipal polls. I will not go into detail here. The most important about conducting those polls is that they created evidence on citizens' perceptions of corruption as a problem as at the municipal level. And you can see on the right-hand side of this slide that in all 10 municipalities, 50 or 50 plus percent of respondents uh, said that corruption is somewhat of a problem in their municipality. We, uh, equipped with this qualitative and quantitative data, we uh, asked uh, the mayors of uh, the 10 municipalities uh, to sign a municipal anti-corruption pact. What is the importance of, of this um, 
pact from a methodology point of view. It is important because it signaled political support and commitment right before we embarked um, on the uh, process of designing the uh, reform, anti-corruption reform agendas. Uh, the design of the reform agendas was done uh, through working groups that brought together representatives of the local administrations, municipal councils, and um, CSOs. IRI equipped those working groups with a catalog of reforms that they were free to uh, amend, expand, um, and we took them through a two-stage process whereby they first selected the vulnerabilities to corruption that they wanted to address through the reform agendas, and secondly, um, worked on the reforms with which they wanted to, these vulnerabilities to be addressed. The designed uh, reform agendas were adopted by unanimity by the working groups, which um, ensured a multi-stakeholder consensus on the vulnerabilities, but also on the solutions for those vulnerabilities. The reform agendas were submitted to um, the mayors of the municipalities in December 22. So far, we have six official adoptions by decisions of municipal councils. You can see a list of the municipalities that adopted those reform agendas in the uh, order of adoption. Um, there are four municipalities that uh, remain to adopt um, the reform agendas uh, shortly within the next months. Uh, on this slide you will see some examples of the reforms that are part of the reform agendas. Uh, those examples relate to a variety um, of vulnerabilities but can be broadly cl clustered in reforms that tackle challenges related to transparency. Uh, challenges related to the salience of integrity mechanisms um, and challenges related to uh, civic participation. Last but not least, uh, the engagement of CSOs throughout this process and throughout anti-corruption work in general, as we will, I'm sure, all agree, um, is crucial. Um, we have been engaging CSOs in our working group process from the start of our program. Um, and just a few weeks ago, we held a CSO training, uh, bringing uh, together representatives of organizations from the 10 municipalities to make sure that they're well equipped to support and monitor the implementation of the adopted reform agendas. In a nutshell, uh, this is the, the, the current anti-corruption programming done by IRI and the methodology that uh, stands behind it. And I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sofia. I guess from Sofia. <laughs> that uh, to introducing, uh, inter introducing to us this new methodology for uh, working in the municipal level. Uh, hopefully we'll get uh, back here in a few years time to assess the effects of this uh, methodology and maybe expand it to the rest of Bulgaria, but also implement in our own countries as a, as a tool for, for fighting corruption. Also, for me, it was noticeable this emphasizing on citizen uh, disengagement because it's not really only for, uh, for the corruption issues, but on many issues um, that where public participation or citizens' involvement is important uh, in policy making and other things, especially on municipal level. Those are lacking mainly because we adopted systems that are not linking the votes, voting for, to the accountability to the citizens, but more to the political parties. But that's another issues that we may we may debate here and finally to conclude the the panel uh, opening speeches with uh, andre maksud uh, take the take the floor and then we'll go to the debate it's pretty late in the well it's pretty late in the evening so i'll try to move pretty fast um, we've talked today about the concept of strategic corruption and some of the mechanisms by which it manifests. We haven't really talked a lot about the structures by which strategic corruption has an impact at national level, so that's what, we're, what I'm intending to do here. Um, a bit of, a, a of myth-busting before we begin. Um, 
corruption is not a homogenous phenomenon. So typically when we um, hear people discussing about corruption, they say something like, oh, everybody's corrupt, everybody at the top is in on it, it's all uh, connected. Um, it's not necessarily the case, though. There is corruption, even in the most corrupt societies, there is corruption that is somehow divided according to camps. And these are corruption networks um, that aren't necessarily allies of each other. So, so we can understand um, strategic corruption as a phenomenon which affects one network of corruption in a given country, but maybe not others. And that one network receives resources and support from outside governments or outside forces in order to successfully compete with other rival networks in a country for resources, power, and so on. Um, this is a phenomenon that has been documented before in Magyar Madlovic. They mentioned that political competition in post communist countries especially is often a facade for competition between different patronal networks, meaning that even though um, there is political competition, even though there are legitimate elections and genuine power turnover, the winners simply bring their own clients into power and the process of um, using public resources for private gains continues. Uh, the differences, however, can be, there are some differences however, that can be noticed between how these networks operate within a country. It's not a unitary phenomenon even within the same country, in the case of Romania in this case. And those differences that we observe can be split uh, into different categories according to incumbency, electoral performance, and type of office, in this case decision maker or lower level civil servant, which is in line with the presentation that Todor showed a bit earlier. Um, to understand this visually, this is a general model of corruption in Romania. Now, I could talk for an hour about this model and what we see here, but focus a little bit on the role of citizens and what they do. Uh, they put incumbents in power through elections and they offer speed money, or in this case, bribe other resources, to civil servants for various benefits. The important thing to note here is, one, elections change not just the incumbents in office, but the entire network itself. So the incumbents who give access to resources to their clients in exchange for kickbacks and who appoint loyal civil servants to the administration also in exchange for kickbacks, these are all connected. So you oust one incumbent, bring in another, and they will bring their own networks in place to, re, to re, um, reignite this entire process. And the second thing I'd like to notice about this is that rival networks oftentimes monitor and denounce each other. So even though both networks or multiple networks are corrupt, they do, for the sake of the competition, with other rival networks, they do sometimes act as um, whistleblowers or they sometimes act as, uh, they sometimes cooperate with authorities against rivals. Uh, and th there is some evidence of this happening, which I will go into now a little bit. Uh, the first piece of evidence that we have is an incumbency bias that we see. So by and large in Romania, we notice that mayors that are from the same party at a bit of context, first of all. Romania is divided into several counties, about 40, and each county has um, one county council president whose power is quite significant because they're the ones that decide uh, how much money from the government goes to mayors at lower level. And what we've noticed is that when mayors are from the same party as the county council presidents, they are indicted or investigated much less than those that are from a different party, which seems to indicate 
either that county council presidents can control prosecutors and tell them who to investigate or not, which is unlikely. We can't really work with that assumption. There's no evidence at this point of that happening in the data that we looked at, at least. But there's also a possibility that county council presidents or bosses in general stay silent about corruption within their own network while reporting to the authorities corruption in rival networks. And this is the first piece of evidence that we see in the incumbency bias. There is no such incumbency bias related to EU funds. If you look back a bit to the model of corruption here and the role of the European Union that supplies EU funds and oversight, we see that in the oversight that European Union has over um, EU funding, there is no incumbency bias. You're equally likely to be investigated whether you are a mayor from the uh, county opposition or from the county incumbent. It doesn't matter. It, it does, however, matter when it comes to funds that are not from the European Union, in which case you are twice as likely to be investigated if you're from the opposition than if you are from the incumbent. And we have data for this. I'm not going to go into it now because we're short on time. The third conclusion, like I mentioned, is that county bosses or bosses in general tolerate corruption within their own network. And this is how networks consolidate themselves and grow. There was actually a um, competition in Romania a few years back about joining corrupt networks in order to gain protection from prosecution. The second piece of evidence that we have that this phenomenon happens is in electoral performance. And here you see a map of Romania divided into the counties that we looked at. Green are the counties where there has been a change in the ruling party in an, at least one of the, th of the past three electoral cycles from, 20, uh, from 2008 to 2020. And red shows counties where no such change took place. So the same party was in power through the entire intervals, and these we call party strongholds. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into demographics and such. Uh, suffice it to say that, generally speaking, party strongholds tend to be less populated and poorer. This isn't always the case, but they, they tend to be so, and the difference is significant. And here we have further evidence of electoral performance that affect, that, that points to networks protecting their own. Uh, there are a lot of figures here, so I'll only ask you to focus on the uh, table to the right, to the left, sorry, my right, your left. Um, the first row, Incumb incumbent, while the, um, in, party strongholds, that's, where, that's what the table refers to. In party strongholds, we see that when the party that is in charge at local level in the county is also in government, we see the fewest, we see the fewest investigations of proven corruption cases. So all of these cases are, are proven. There, there's a definitive sentence, it all happened there. And compare, please, the difference between the incumbents and the opposition. What do we see? when? In a party, when the party that is in power in a party stronghold where they have very strong local networks, they control a lot of mayors, they have high electoral support, and they also control the government, we see the fewest instances of investigations for corruption. That same county, in that same context, only in opposition, we see an, a, a significant increase in the number of um, investigations. Now, people don't just suddenly become less corrupt because they're in government or more corrupt because they're in opposition. In fact, evidence would point to the, other, to, to the opposite being true. You, te you might assume you're more corrupt when your network is stronger and you're receiving more money from the government. However, the fact that this, that this pattern is reversed points to the fact that when there is a change in, a, in a government and the parties that are strong in a county uh, join the opposition, they begin to be, the, their networks begin to come under attack. When the prefects, for example, or anti-corruption agencies from the center are controlled by uh, political forces that are hostile, that's when you see an increase in number of investigations and a dismantling of the networks, as you can see, because the 
uh, number of lower level civil servants that are investigated increases much more than the number of decision makers, which points to them, have to, the, to there being uh, several involved with uh, one decision maker. If you look at the other table though, which refers to um, counties where you've had competition and where power turnover happens quite frequently, then the networks in place are not as consolidated. There is not one party that controls a lot of mayors and can rely on electoral support. In those cases, the threat of being replaced during elections is very real very real and this is why you see that the pattern is reversed you see more investigations while that party is also in government than when they are in opposition what this can be explained by an incentive of that party to clamp down on rival political networks. So they use extra resources and extra influence while incumbent in order to it, to uh, denounce and get their political rivals investigated, consolidating their hold on the county in the hopes of future re-election. This, this is a breakdown of the main conclusions that I've already um, mentioned here. What I'd like to point out again is that based on this data we can uh, draw a conclusion that consolidated networks are less likely to denounce corrupt behavior. And this has a few implications for policy. First of all, because corruption is a heterogeneous phenomenon, we cannot use one-size-fits-all policies, like sweeping policies at national level and expect them to have the same uh, effect everywhere. Patronal networks are quite dynamic, they compete with each other, and they sometimes cooperate with public institutions against rival, uh, or against rival corruption networks, which is why integrity agencies and um, authorities should focus their efforts on older, more consolidated network where the chances of whistleblowers uh, appearing are much, uh, much less than in uh, cases where rival networks have an incentive to denounce each other. And the last, last conclusion that might help is that frequent power turnover, especially at local level, may help with controlling corruption. This is the same kind of phenomenon that we see at national level between democracies where you have genuine competition for power and autocracies where you have one pole of power and every network is consolidated around that one pole. You simply have more incentive to, for integrity in a competitive setting. But it doesn't, uh, this doesn't apply just to national level. You need to have the same kind of mechanisms in local politics as well. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the following section. Thank you, Andre, for this interesting presentation, uh, starting from the myth busting that we can debate about, especially this coverage of uh, rivalry in uh, politi politics for, uh, for corruptive networks. And actually, it took me a few slides to realize that uh, what, when you talk about corruptive ne networks, you more or less speak about political parties. <laughs> So where that stands. Uh, this concludes the part of the initial uh, in introductory speeches for our panelists. So now I open the, the floor for questions or comments uh, from, from you in the audience. And um, uh, I think we still have, according to the agenda, at least 10 minutes. Uh, and I guess we can stay a bit more. There is a question here. You said a question or a comment. So I'd like to make a comment. The idea is okay, we have to base, our, to base our decision on numbers, but not only on numbers. This is for Andre, for uh, my compatriot here. When you're talking about corruption, integrity, maybe you will find moments when numbers are not the most important things in analyzing this phenomenon. So you may commit a mistake if you do not have the right information. I stated the idea and the importance to have the inside information from people that know how the things are made there. Yeah? So whistleblowing. 
and how to reward them, to make them to assume the risk to be a whistleblower. I don't know if you were in the position of a whistleblower, to act as a whistleblower. It's not very pleasant, usually. So, the comment is like this. We will, we are able to make rankings, tops, and so on. But what we have to do is to interpret data, not to be slaves of data. Because otherwise, we will put in a ranking Russian Federation on 46, and Greece as inventor of democracy and democratic principles on 58. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's collect uh, one, two more que questions, as this was more comment than a question. Anybody else from the audience? Ruslan? Going back, thank you. Uh, quite interesting panel, because this is, uh, I mean, I, I think this is where we go local and uh, need to focus on, on these networks in, uh, indeed. My question was, back to national security, maybe to the representatives of the two um, uh, anti-corruption agencies in uh, uh, Kosovo and, and Montenegro. Um, have you seen a, a, a drive to securitize anti-corruption um, in, in recent years? And what has, you know, what, what have been the, um, the evidence about that? And what has it changed, the, how has this changed your uh, uh, way of, uh, of working? And then to the, uh, to the whole panel, uh, in terms of uprooting those networks uh, about which Andre spoke, um, and if I understand the principles of, of competition, I would like to talk about checks and balances, you know, and I think this is precisely the idea. I mean, if you keep, uh, and of course you have the checks and balances, but you have also law enforcement. So if you have on the one hand side law enforcement that takes out the longest existing networks and then you have some competition to prevent others from uh, from from uh, doing so what do you see as a you know have you seen any example or instrument of such a network being taken out I know in Romania you had quite a number of mayors and people taken out uh, and do you see any learning in the system because for example I've seen for many many years the corruption pressure on uh, on customs before we were members of the EU after they removed the customs that's clear you know you don't have any any more depression because uh, it doesn't exist but before that you had a constant kind of pressure on doing that the same thing with public procurement you know you have quite a lot of of data and and it shows you know it clearly shows that there are concentration of public procurement there is uh, lack of quality so the question is where do we begin? You know, is there any sector, any, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, mechanism that we want to target? Thank you. Thank you, Ruslan. And is there any last question maybe to collect and then go to the answers? Or if not, we move to the, to the final words, uh, I guess, uh, starting from the anti-corruption agencies uh, on the question of uh, Ruslan and then other panelists, if they feel. Uh... Okay. Uh, thank you. I think uh, comments and questions were uh, great. I, I would like just to go back to what our colleagues from Romania stated. I think uh, what whistleblower, uh, the way that whistleblowing system works in, in United States, for example, is very difficult to work in our region without having, on top of that, without having even motivation, financial motivation to to report. Uh, it's, I think what we expect in our country is uh, a bit too much uh, for a person to report uh, wrongdoings uh, in case he's removed from a job to go to the court to get that right and that takes up to 10 years. So it's a bit too much uh, even without having any kind of motivation to do that except this uh, uh, self-sacrificing motivation for the good of the public which is okay but is very uh, I think complex and difficult to work in the smaller environments and I think our societies are very small so it's very difficult also to remain like without uh, the identity to remain like not known because everyone knows everyone in smaller uh, regions so it's another I think uh, topic that we should maybe rethink when we if we will revisit uh, the law on whistleblower 
we're still blowing, even though I, I know that it's like 100% in line with the EU directive on still blowing, but we should take also, I think, in the question of the context that we work on, on our uh, daily basis. Uh, then going back to the other uh, topic raised, I think yes, it's going both ways. It's going like positively, negatively, how to say the, sec the securitization of uh, corruption. I'm saying in a negative way because, for example, starting from uh, transparency, because of the potential to, how to say, to get uh, the other side, the, like the top secret information, which is not top secret, uh, we have legislation in place that, for example, now the assets of uh, uh, officials in Kosovo that have some uh, connection to security, to public security, they should not be public anymore. So it's kind of uh, closing down the institution and that on itself may have the risk of increasing corruption rather than reducing and preserving uh, the, the security of the state. On the other side, we have a positive trend when uh, institutions that uh, deliver or they maintain security, uh, they are starting to, you know, to make their integrity plans internal. So they are thinking this more seriously. We have, for example, Ministry of Interior, including police and other uh, services that uh, have already uh, uh, done these integrity plans and they are in place with all the measures. And we also, I'm talking about the defense also, about uh, the intelligence. Uh, so it's, 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 it's influencing our work. So it's making our work a bit less transparent, so to say. Uh, but also it's putting additional pressure to, to put in place this integrity mechanisms that would uh, contribute also to, to our, our, our work. So that is more or less my comment on these two uh, issues raised. Thank you. Um, 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 I think that the whistleblowers is very important and uh, in Montenegro uh, in last month we have very, uh, very good uh, cases or bad cases, maybe maybe it's not good. Good is not a uh, uh, fine word for, for that situation because uh, visa blowers uh, apply to agency that the, uh, judicial, the judicial council uh, has um, uh, has some uh, wrong, um, uh, wrong or criminal uh, acts to uh, elected the judges of um, of uh, high court in Montenegro. That's I think very big cases, and the whistleblower said everything right, and the uh, the election for uh, one uh, one uh, judges um, is. Uh, uh, very, very uh, wrong, and uh, its uh, agency um, uh, opened the cases. And um, I think uh, last uh, uh, ten days ago, we uh, have uh, opinion about that cases, and it's very important for Montenegro, and it, it's important uh, to show uh, every every state's uh, institution that. Uh, Every, everything uh, will be transparent and everything uh, uh, can uh, be uh, out of institution. So whistleblowers in Montenegro, I think that's, uh, uh, that, that's the uh, good uh, for Montenegro. Uh, another, uh, another questions, I think that uh, our colleagues can uh, say something and about uh, integrity plans, uh, every state in uh, Montenegro and uh, we are a very small country, but we have uh, around 1,000 state, uh, state uh, um, institutions, <laughs> so we have uh, very much uh, plans uh, integrity, but we have a uh, good, good, uh, uh, we, we have good uh, uh, job in, uh, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, part of our work because uh, OECD said that we have uh, 4.5 uh, 4, uh, uh, what's in great great about uh, integrity plan so <laughs> we are good and and that and that uh, part of uh, work of agency thank you thank you Jelena just yeah just continue if you feel like 
Thanks. Um, in respect, I'm, I'm tempted to comment on the comment about the whistleblowers. Um, I would say at the municipal level, when where everyone knows everyone in the majority of cases, um, uh, a huge challenge is anonymity. And in Bulgaria, is the case that the law does not uh, allow for anonymous signals to be investigated. Um, and this is a challenge, a real tangible challenge. The, the, the practical solution here would be intermediaries, providing a channel for citizens, for whistleblowers to share signals with an institution or a CSO or other intermediary that will then officialize those channels. Um, going back to Ruslan's uh, questions, um, you asked what sectors uh, we would start with. How about thinking in a cross-sectoral manner and focus not so much on sectors such as procurement um, or hiring um, of uh, uh, civic um, servants, but rather take a cross-sectoral approach and, and focus on institutions and, and how the legislative framework is, is being implemented. Um, and in respect to the question about um, networks, um, and this is more a question for Andre, whether he's seen um, an example of networks taking out. Um, I would say that even if certain networks are taken out, um, if we don't change the system through reforms, then new networks, as we saw from your data, are quite fast to establish themselves and fill in that void. So again, let's focus on changing the system through reforms so that we make it harder and harder and harder for those networks to form as opposed to focusing on taking out particular networks because uh, this might be a, um, an, internal, like a, an eternal fight with, uh, without um, a very big impact. Andre. Thank you. Um, regarding the issue of whistleblowers, uh, we generally assume that whistleblowers are honest civil servants or people who work within the institution who just want integrity and therefore they blow the whistle on corruption for the sake of integrity. This is not necessarily the case. It oftentimes, and we've actually seen cases like this in Romania, it oftentimes happens that whistleblowers or people who go to uh, authorities to denounce corrupt behavior, they are part of corruption networks themselves or loyal to other corrupt uh, decision makers, but they're simply not in the one that is currently in power. We've had, for example, cases where mayors were denounced to the authorities and sent to jail for uh, things that they committed by the vice mayor and the vice mayor then of course took over his office so we can't really say that they were acting altruistically that's one of the problems that we have with uh, whistleblowing legislation in general it requires corrupt deeds to already have happened they don't prevent things they simply uh, lead to capture of uh, uh, of people who already committed the deed um, in terms of what you can do uh, as I understand Ruslan's question the issue with uh, corruption networks that keep appearing isn't removing one network from power. That happens every time there's power turnover in a county in Romania. So that happens very frequently. Or whenever a party collapses and doesn't make it into parliament or loses the, or simply ceases to exist, the network itself is dismantled or you know, it moves to, from a, an organization level to, to a, an individual level. So each person with their personal clients. The, the problem there isn't how to stop networks, uh, how to dismantle them. The problem is how to prevent new ones from appearing, as, as was already stated. And that is a much more difficult uh, challenge. What we've seen in Romania over the past 20 years or so is a crackdown on petty corruption. So you had corruption uh, that was very individualized because everybody could collect a bribe for themselves. So you had problems with traffic police, you had problems with border police, you had problems with uh, individual civil servants at the booth who would interact directly with citizens. And what we've noticed is that uh, co 
that these things not only harmed the development of a community, but they also really upset decision makers. Because if you're, a, because if you're corrupt individually, there's no kickback going up the chain. Your boss doesn't get any money if you're corrupt and not part of a network. So we saw crackdowns in the sense that cameras were mounted in institutions to film people at the booth so you can't uh, pay a bribe. Police officers now are required to wear body cams and microphones so every interaction is recorded. It's very difficult now to bribe a traffic policeman, for example, in Romania. But we've seen very little being done on actually dismantling networks and tackling grand corruption, which is uh, the access to resources that decision makers give to their direct clients. There's been very little done there. That is the, the challenge. And some of the solutions that we've seen are, first of all, more democracy, depolitization, insulate the bureaucracy from the decision makers as much as possible, because otherwise, uh, they're very easy to, 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 I wouldn't say necessarily a double, to, to lure into your, your existing networks. Um, and of course, for the short term, you can just use one corrupt network against the other. Just change, change the incumbents frequently with every election, if possible. And then, uh, and then work with the opposition to oversee the new incumbents. It's a ping pong game, but it's so far the best thing we have. Thank you, Andre. And this with incumbents uh, fighting and changing over uh, functions if they actually fight the others. Uh, but uh, in many cases, they just tolerate each other. They, f they complain and, uh, and expose. But when the time comes to prosecute, <laughs> they don't do it, even do it when they come to, to power. Uh, would you like? Uh, Thank you, uh, Alexander. Um, we, we had recently a case with uh, discussing with one public organization here in Bulgaria about the whistleblowers. So how to uh, work with whistleblowers within the organization uh, when, you know, even in a big public organization, it's very difficult when someone needs to report actually the, his or her colleagues. And uh, the problem is that the defense of the person who is reporting is almost impossible because, uh, you know, when two people know uh, something, all, uh, all the others know the, the same and um, uh, know it also. So uh, uh, the question was, is it possible to uh, have real protection for whistleblowers in public organizations or you need to um, uh, make or ensure procedures with the boards to go to another public organization like for example anti-corruption uh, commission but in this case the uh, the uh, uh, I would say uh, middle and top management of this public organization said something like okay but if they go there to the anti-corruption commission then it will be clear that we didn't um, uh, we didn't, uh, we haven't did our job uh, uh, in a proper way, so there will be uh, a problem for us. It's better to uh, whistleblowers to report to within uh, organizations, so internally, uh, and not to uh, report these facts to some outside of us. Uh, so there is this uh, discrepancy between the, uh, the goals of the public organizations sometimes, which is also uh, an important thing. And um, uh, in most of the cases, uh, this, uh, in a way, uh, lead to uh, kind of uh, freezing the uh, the possible uh, counteractions uh, that can be implemented. Uh, and uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, securization, uh, um, and what uh, Andre just said about the ping pong game, uh, I like this. Uh, um, 
one of the most effective measures that have been outlined in most of uh, these uh, uh, anti-corruption assessments that we have done in uh, more than 20 uh, public organizations uh, uh, across all Europe uh, is rotation of the staff. So it looks very easy to be done, but on a practical side it is not, uh, but it but the result shows that this is one of the most effective uh, uh, anti-corruption measures. Why? Because when you rotate the staff, uh, actually you cut the links to the local uh, uh, networks. Um, uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, with the rotation of the staff, you can even introduce some uh, what we call uh, uh, um, uh, some new people uh, within the uh, within the uh, uh, teams uh, that uh, that including could be part of the uh, uh, part of the inspectorate or uh, part of the uh, uh, other units that are entitled to uh, investigate uh, uh, the wrongdoings. Um, but what will happen if you have a systematic corruption in a given uh, uh, in a given uh, public organization? Like right now, uh, most uh, of the colleagues here in Bulgaria knows there is a, a problem with the pub, uh, with the border police because the, 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 there is a lot of migrants crossing freely actually the border uh, and most of them have been catched by police uh, within the country or uh, on the other border to Serbia and Romania and so on. Um, and uh, most of the, uh, in most of the cases it is clear that there are some employees, there are some officers from the border police that are cooperating with uh, uh, the migrants, uh, that there is systematic corruption and, uh, uh, there. And uh, at the same time, uh, this shows how this systematic corruption in some cases could have a very serious could be a very serious threat to national security, like in this case, uh, as there could be not only migrants crossing the border, but also there could be some uh, smugglers, there could be some uh, uh, drug smugglers and so on, uh, uh, crossing together with the migrants, as it was the case in a few of uh, the examples uh, here in the last year. So uh, uh, that is why uh, uh, the, uh, the anti-corruption measures and the uh, anti-corruption policies uh, uh, should be prioritized by, uh, by all the institutions and, uh, uh, and that is why the, the, the uh, anti-corruption efforts uh, should not be, uh, um, uh, how to say, periodic, but uh, should be uh, present uh, constantly. Thank you, Todor, and especially for connecting corruption with national security, which was the, the topic of the whole conference. So I think this was a, a good closure, so I want to thank you, thank all the panelists, thank you all for uh, staying <laughs> until the end. Also thank the, the organizers, uh, especially Ministry of Justice and the Basel Institute of on Governance, but of course uh, mostly to the Center for Study of Democracy, Ruslan, Daniela, Christina, and especially Gloria, as I heard. Sorry if I missed somebody. And as we are promoting monitoring uh, of, uh, of others, uh, organizers also asked me to, to tell you that we are also want to be monitored, so to remind you to fill evaluation forms <laughs> about the conference. And with that note, I leave you to uh, uh, finish the day and enjoy the, the evening, uh, especially those going on the, on the cocktail party of the ministry, uh, but uh, I wish you all the best and as Todor ended up, there is still a lot of work to do and to fight this systematic uh, corruption, so see you soon on some other event like this. Thank you all.